You're listening to Teen Monologues, a youth-led theater project that went digital. I'm Sophia, your host. In this episode, our monologues will focus on identity. Identity is all the ways we answer the question of who we are. And identity often shines through in the places where we are challenged or questioned by others. We'll hear from three students this week who wrote monologues around identity. Up first, we have Parker, who wrote a monologue about exploring their gender identity with the help of the internet. Hi, my name is Parker and I go by all pronouns. I want to do this because I don't really know how I want to identify, and that's totally okay. I'm only 15, and even if you're 50 years old, it's okay not to know. People come to terms with themselves at different paces. Now what really is gender? To me, it's what makes you feel comfortable in your own body. Someone can feel comfortable identifying with their born sex, but others don't. It's hard for non-binary people to get recognized because of the stigma of how our parts equal our gender. Uterus equals girl equals liking stereotypically girlish things. And as a group, we've gotten better at accepting that girl doesn't always equal liking girlish things. But we still struggle with accepting the fact that uterus doesn't always equal girl. Uterus equals boy equals liking stereotypically boyish things is also true and definitely okay. I mentioned the term non-binary, but what really is that? Non-binary consists of gender identities that aren't exclusively masculine or feminine. They're identities that are outside the gender binary. A cool fact I wanted to share is a very brief history of the word genderqueer. Its origin comes from the queer zins of the late 1980s, and zins are unofficial articles of information produced by anybody. So basically, genderqueer people created their own term to identify and shared it with others, which is so amazing to think about. And people are still following in that footsteps, but now it's just online. I don't really know how I want to identify or who I am now, but that's totally okay. How many of us actually know who we are and where we're going? But I do have friends and resources and zins and as cheesy as it sounds, the internet to help. And it has. In seventh grade, my friend came out as trans, and that day I went home and did as much research as I could to try and help. A year later, I was questioning my own gender, so I hopped back onto my laptop and began to type away. And what in the world would I do without Wikipedia? For a while, I thought I was trans, which looking back on it now is kind of funny to think about because I know that's not who I am. But I kept searching, and then suddenly I found it. Non-binary. I didn't know what it meant, but I liked the sound of it. I'm still struggling with the label though. I'm still struggling with the fact that I could just be desperately grasping at straws to answer the question of who I am, but it's easier to talk about it. I haven't really been able to talk about this with people, but I'm so grateful you guys are listening to me talk because this gives me a platform to express myself with others who I like me. So hi, my name is Parker and I go by all pronouns. Thank you so much, Parker. Can you introduce yourself for us? So as I said, hi, my name is Parker and I go by all pronouns. I am in ninth grade and I'm very dramatic. <laughs> well, I have a couple of questions for you, if that's all right. Totally, go ahead. All right, so out of all the monologues in the show, I noticed that internet resources come up the most in yours. Can you elaborate on why you chose that as your theme in your monologue and how has the internet shaped you and informed your identity. So I chose the theme. I I chose the theme of technology for my monologue because to, it's helped me so much, and it's helped me understand people so much better and understand myself so much better. And yeah, yeah, technology and identity definitely go hand in hand, especially right now in this current day and age. So I completely agree with that. I think people who never had to question their own identity may not understand how powerful exploration can be. They may assume that exploration, particularly around gender identity, means someone is confused or lost. In your monologue, you suggest that it's the opposite. Why do you think exploration is so important? Exploration to me is important because it helps somebody really shape who they want to be because they've spent all their life being this person that they're not. And to allow them to explore and be like, I don't like that term, 
but I kind of like this term, but I like this term a little bit more, is so important because it allows somebody to really come to terms with themselves and finally be who they are. Wow, awesome. How do you think the rise of the internet has changed how people discuss gender identity and how they reach out to other people exploring the same ideas? So it's allowed people to share their own experiences with people who are just like them, and it's allowed people who are still trying to figure out who they are read these experiences and be like, I feel that same way. And these Instagram pages are so important because I was looking at them today and I was like, these people are so beautiful that they get to share themselves with others and they get to help people with the, with their own ideas and own troubles. So, Yeah, I definitely think that identity and social media come into they have a very interesting relationship with one another but more specifically the lgbtq plus community has a very special role in that and it's a chance to connect and just communities in general they have a chance to connect over social media so that's an amazing answer all right one last question what's something you would say to someone who is exploring their gender identity and perhaps experiencing a related issue at the same time like bullying and or mental health struggles well, I know it's hard because I'm still struggling as well. And it just just go and just learn and just experience it. And bullying, they're just jealous of you because you are being your real authentic self. And that's the best thing you can be. Well, thank you so much, Parker. Of course. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from B who wrote their monologue about staying strong while living in a society that disrespects non-binary identity. So there's this girl, and she's pretty special to me. I think about her a lot. She makes me feel feelings I didn't even know existed. The way she makes me feel is indescribable. Man, you have no idea. Let me try to put it into words. She makes me feel like... like... like shit. We were talking the other day, like we usually do. We talk all the time. But this time, things were different. You see, this was the day after I came out to her, and I don't know why, but I just assumed that things would be different. I incorrectly assumed that she would try to give me even the slightest bit of respect. So we were talking, and she kept calling me she. She now knows I don't like being called that, I guess she just doesn't know how she makes me feel, how every she feels like a personal attack or an accusation managing to invalidate my identity, how every she feels like a punch in the gut, or how every she feels like an actual stab. She hurts. I used to get asked a lot, so you're a girl, right? And I would awkwardly reply with an unsure yes, but now that I actually know my gender, nobody asks anymore. Everyone just assumes I'm a girl, which is wildly false, and don't get me wrong, me saying that I'm not a girl does not make me a boy, it just makes me me and I am valid. You know that non-binary identities have existed since before the 18th century, but here I am and a whole lot of people are acting like I'm some Tumblr fad or something new. My indigenous ancestors who came before me didn't care if you were a boy or a girl or an other, you were just you and that's all that mattered. If I were born a few generations earlier, my tribe would have said that I was sacred and beautiful, but unfortunately that's not the case today. I was born in this generation and I'm stuck here being misgendered on the daily no matter how many times I correct people or out myself, no matter how many allies I have, you know that allies are never quick to defend the non-binary trans person. Anyways, I use they them pronouns but everyone feels inclined to call me she. Some people act like it's some huge inconvenience or grammatically incorrect to call me they, like they them pronouns can and have been used singularly since the words were invented. Most of my friends still call me she, despite them knowing I don't want to be called that and it hurts. It hurts a lot more than I think it should because if I wanted my friends to call me he, 
I know they would have never called me she again after I told them that. But I guess calling me by non-binary pronouns is too much for them. And I get it because our society is so binary and everything is constantly being gendered. But is it really too much? Is it too much to ask? Is it that hard? I don't get it. Anyways, I'm non-binary and I'm valid and I have to tell myself that every single day because nobody else will. Thanks for listening. For once. Wow, thank you, B. If you could, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is B. I use they, them pronouns. I'm in the 12th grade, and I'm non-binary. Awesome. Thank you so much. If that's okay, we have a couple questions for you. You wrote this last year to read for our theater production as one of a couple options, but we ended up going with a different monologue for you to read in last year's production. How did it feel to finally be able to read something you've kept in the archives for a while? It feels amazing to finally be able to read this piece because it's my favorite thing I've ever written and it feels great to finally put it out there to the world. Yeah, that's awesome. The sense that I get from your monologue is that you're almost writing to this person who keeps misgendering you. What would you wish you could say to them and how did it feel to do that? I wish I could tell them how much they're hurting me and how much pain they cause me. And it would be really empowering to finally do that. Yeah, and in your monologue, you kind of did in a way, which I think is awesome. Um, Towards the end of the monologue, you said that if you had transitioned to a male gender identity, people would be more respectful of that transition. Why do you think that's the case? I think that would be the case because of how binary gender is in society. Everything is so black and white that if I were, if I were one or the other, if I were a man or a woman, I would be more respected in my identity. Yeah. You mentioned that your ancestors would have considered your identity to be sacred and beautiful in the monologue. Can you tell us more about that concept? Well, in indigenous cultures, a third gender identity has typically been a thing in most communities. And two-spirit identities are considered sacred and beautiful in those cultures. In your monologue, you say that you tell yourself every day that you're valid. What is your process in doing that? I'm asking because I think that that's a skill probably a lot of us need and a reminder that, you know, we're good enough. How do you take care of yourself when you're being misgendered? When I'm being misgendered, I mostly ignore it because it's something that happens literally every day and that will probably always happen. But when the, my process of telling myself that I'm valid is literally me standing in the bathroom, looking in the mirror and telling myself that I'm valid. Well, awesome. You are valid, B, And thank you. No problem. And lastly, we have a poem written by Oscar about their experiences as an immigrant. I remember being young, sitting across the colorful flags and sad stones, bright cempasuchil marigolds beneath my feet and above the tables. Sweet and savory scents that sang throughout the room as the spirits of my relatives danced within their song. A song of happiness, of peace. I didn't think much of Dia de los Muertos when I was younger in Mexico. I lived among my culture and my people and had nothing to worry about. Raised in a protective manner, existing within mom's and dad's walls of living. Mother house of love, dad of understanding. Tough, comfortable, unchallenged. I realize now just how similar Dia de los Muertos is to my story as an immigrant. Because when you die, you move on to another world, a more colorful world. And that was what America was to me, a promise. A promise of a more vibrant world full of opportunity and hope. That's what my mom said it would be. 
And I can't help but wonder how many other boys and girls and folk like me sat sad alone among the simpasucho on the trees. How many of us, how many of I, which army of me would it take for them to realize that we are people? But the simpasucho never fades. The bright yellow orange colors that shine so brightly even after death. Petals that carry a child's dreams inside them. Memories, promises, and tears shed by mother as we departed the streets of Mexico. Tears that flooded my eyes feel ghostly on my memory. The only things which I remember are the saddest of them all. And I never learned to understand the fear and loathing that I felt. It seems that I've coped wrongly and I can't seem to remember anything at all. But sometimes, sometimes it's simply names. Sometimes it's longer memories. But like a ghost, I only seem to remember they existed once a small petal of remembrance falls on the empty road. The laughter, of the culture, the innocence, all things I failed to appreciate. And as we crossed the Yellow River, moved on to another life, it was like I died. I left my childish memories behind and from that point on there were nothing but memories. Memories I still fail to remember. And sometimes I mourn the person which I was. The boy I left behind and the house and all other bodies of myself. The only thing I remember now are the promises. And only, only because they are broken. Why don't you introduce yourself for us? I'm Oscar. Um, I use uh, he, them pronouns. I'm in 12th grade, um, and I'm an artist. Thank you, Oscar. You used the English and Spanish word for marigold, Sempasuchil. What inspired the imagery of the river of marigolds? I think that a lot of the inspiration for the imagery comes from the actual use of sempasuchil in the culture. So uh, sempasuchil are used in the Ale de los Muertos to guide spirits um, among the cemetery to, to guide them to their family and their ofrendas and, you know, basically be like a light or a hope. So that's kind of what I insinuated with the marigolds, that they're little bits of hope that I still feel sometimes. So that's what inspired yeah, that. Yeah, that was such a beautiful part of your poem as well. It really stuck with us. Thank you. One of the differences between your situation at the beginning and end of your monologue is that you were unchallenged at the beginning. You said you had nothing to worry about, but after you made the journey to the U.S., both of those things had changed. What were examples of those changes, and how did they affect you? I think, um, I think a lot of the... Living in Mexico, uh, I was a child, um, you know, growing up with the same friends and the same traditions for years, and I feel like I wasn't ever challenged to really think or wonder about things outside of um, my house or problems outside of myself or, you know, even politics or taxes or anything of the kind. Um, it was like, sometimes the I feel that my immigration made me mature a lot in the sense that I had to, like, quickly understand that, you know, sometimes people like me are not welcomed or sometimes, you know, there's 
a lot of political issues <laughs> that influence me and my family. So I think that's a big part of my of my writing, um, to understanding that I kind of grew up a lot during this process, obviously, and literally. <laughs> you spoke about broken promises at the end of your monologue. What were those promises, and how were they broken? Um, right, so I feel like the promises refer to the American dream, um, this idea that once here, um, it's a perfect land or a perfect place, or there's more opportunities for for us, or that basically things here are better. Um, I understand that the way that a lot of immigrants feel when coming here, it's completely different from what was promised or what was glamorized in Hollywood and that we're not always welcome here, sadly, or that we're not always wanted. <laughs> so it's that idea that we are and that they life here is instantly better when it's not. So that's what I refer to when I say the broken promises. Well, thank you. Yeah, that's really important, I think, to recognize is that we all have a different level of privilege. Yeah, exactly. Do you have a message for the boys and girls and folks like you, the people who have crossed between worlds? Yeah. When I first came here, or when I first got here, um, you know, at such a young age, I was, I think, what, 12 years old. It, I felt a huge disconnect to to my home and to here and you know the the sudden switch of of life like that for for me was like super hard to deal with and I felt super alone and I felt like again that I wasn't welcome here or that my family shouldn't be here or that I should be back home and even sometimes like going back home I feel like as I grew used to life here, I didn't feel welcome back at home, back in Mexico. I felt like people were like, oh, you know, the gringo. <laughs> or people always tried to diminish my experiences because I was no longer someone who lived in Mexico. So I was, a lot of the times, I felt like I wasn't worth a lot or worth, or I didn't live up to the expectations that I should have or that, you know, I'm just a percentage here to the government and, you know, I, I'm unwanted by these, by a lot of these people. And I did live through a lot of aggression <laughs> from p kids my age or even adults, which is so mind blowing to me thinking back on it, the way that some adults treated me because I was an immigrant. and. I also have to admit that I had a lot of privilege in that my family, some of my family was already here. And I know that for some immigrants, it's their first generation coming here. So life is a lot different for them. But I think that my message to anyone who feels the same way that I did or that grew up the same way that I did or that immigrated here is that we should keep together and, you know, not let them make us feel like we're worthless or unhumane or criminals or worthy of being caged up or worthy of being killed or worthy of being kept away, you know, that we're not trash, we're not, we're not bodies, we're people. So that's what I would want to convey to my community that we should stick together and that stand up and be strong, you know. I think a lot of immigrants before, that, like the Chicano movement was super successful in 
challenging a greater evil. And I think that we still have to fight and we still have to keep together and we still have to be viva la raza, as, as Cesar said. <laughs> so I think that's what we have to do. And that's my message to all other immigrants. Wow, thank you so much, Oscar. That was very powerful. Thank you. And now we have some questions we'd like to ask all of our teens on this episode. So first off, I'd like to ask you guys, what inspired you all to join TM? Parker, we'll start with you. So one thing that inspired me to join Team Monologues was the chance to get to meet all these people and just get to learn people's experience. And it's a way to allow myself to be creative. And so that was one of the main reasons why I really wanted to join this program. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, B, what uh, what inspired you to join TM? Well, what inspired me is that I saw it as, a, as an opportunity to express myself and talk about issues that I care about. Yeah, that's awesome. I think TM totally gives that um, opportunity for people to speak their voices. Oscar, what inspired you to join TM? So for me, it's mostly the same uh, thing about getting to share uh, my experiences and having a platform to tell you know our stories I think that's super important so as soon as I heard that this project was happening I was like quick to try to get myself in here <laughs> yeah awesome thank you all what's a big thing about identity that people misunderstand so we could be talking about sexual sexual identity gender identity cultural identity or whatever you guys want to discuss. Parker, we'll start with you. I think people tend to misunderstand that like the way we present ourselves doesn't necessarily relate to how we identify. Like the like one of the big things is like girls who tend to cut their hair really short. Oh my god, she must be a butch lesbian. Like no, she, maybe she just wanted short hair. And that's one of the big things that kind of get me mad is how people tend to relate clothing expression and gender identity and like sexuality and stuff like that like together when they're when they're two totally different things yeah uh b what is one thing about identity that people often misunderstand in your opinion i think people tend to misunderstand that people don't get to choose their identity that identity is not a choice basically yeah yeah absolutely uh oscar so I feel like something that was really misunderstood about identity is intersectionality. Um, like the way that identities, that one person's identity isn't necessarily defined by one thing that they are. So like being an immigrant and being queer or being you know, African-American and, you know, all these things make different experiences for everyone and no two people's experiences will ever be the same because of intersectionality and I think that every person deserves to have a chance to have their own story and experience told and represented in the media so so yeah. <laughs> what is one thing that you have or one thing that you wear that makes you feel the most like yourself? Parker? Would you like to share? Yes. So there, I was I was really struggling with this question at first, cause I couldn't really think of anything. But I thought of this one, like this is super specific, but uh, there's this one pair of leggings my friends bought for me, and that just makes me feel so like the reason that that's so important to me, and like that makes me feel like myself because I cause it makes me feel loved, and it's like these these people bought something from bought me a piece of clothing and that was it's such a weird answer but like that's one of the things that make me feel like myself yeah no whatever makes you feel like yourself is completely valid uh b what about you for me it would be the pins and buttons i have on my backpack because i take them with me everywhere and they're all pretty pretty unique i would say they're all really important to me because i've gotten them at pride events or gifts from friends so they they hold a special place in my heart 
Yeah, I feel that. Um, Oscar, is there a thing that you have or a thing that you wear that makes you feel the most like yourself? Yeah, um, I think that clothing is definitely what makes me feel more like my, most like myself. Um, it's not always necessarily um, groundbreaking, <laughs> but yeah. you know, being able to just you know wear what I like, put whatever I want on my body, it's like. It's, it feels very freeing, like no one else has control over that, and I just don't, it feels like I can express myself without really saying anything, and I don't know, it just makes me feel good. Yeah, exactly, like it doesn't even, even have to be a certain thing that is an item of clothing or anything, I mean for me it's, um, I have this little Kermit that my friend gave me. Um, and it's just like this little stuffed Kermit and it's in my, um, Instagram profile picture, um, along with another Kermit that we met at Disneyland, which I thought was cool. But Kermit currently sits buckled in, in the backseat of my car just cause you know, he has to, you know, safety first. So like, yeah, definitely. It's just a little dorky thing that I have that totally makes me feel like myself. So that is 100% valid. Fee and Parker talked a lot about how other people view them. Stereotypes such as Tumblr fads have been mentioned around gender identity. The internet sometimes gives only one perspective on a group of people when there are many more to consider. Can any of you think of a stereotype you faced and how it impacted you? Parker, uh, we'll start with you. So, in like 7th, 8th grade, there's these kids who I did not like who'd always call me gay and would be like, that's the weird gay girl. Which didn't make sense because they were like 11 and I, I didn't really understand why they were calling me that. But then I got to the point where I started accepting more about my sexuality and who I am. And I kind of took that term from them that they, that they tried to like target me with. And I turned it into something that was powerful and be like, yeah, I'm gay. What do you want to do about it? Yes, that's what I like to hear. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Uh, B, can you think of a stereotype you faced and how it impacted you? Yeah, so for me, growing up and even all the way up until this day, I've been stereotyped as someone who looks or acts like a lesbian. And because so many people have always labeled me as someone who's exclusively attracted to women, I've felt the need to kind of take on that role in order to please other people. So because of the stereotypes I've been faced with, I've repressed my own sexuality. So that sucks. Hopefully you find a way to um, empower yourself through that. And um, I wish you luck on that, especially. Um, Oscar, can you think of a stereotype that you faced and how it impacted you? Yeah, so I think um, there's a lot of stereotypes that affect the immigrant community and the Latino community. One that I know has affected me a lot has been the a lot of the machista expectations um, that come from that same community. Like um, women are supposed to, you know, stay domestic and men are supposed to work and, you know, men can't do this and women can't do that. And, you know, there's so many, you know, restrictions that are just so outdated and I think should not even exist in the first place but they do and it's growing out of those um, stereotypes and stuff like that has been um, a little bit like mind-blowing that like looking back at the way that the things would work back at home and you know the way that people thought back home and even here to this day um, talking with them now I feel like a huge a huge difference that I've been um, able to live outside of those stereotypes yeah that's awesome thank you so much for sharing seeing as we've turned our theater project into a digital podcast what's been your favorite part of this project overall I think one of my favorite parts have been just getting to know all these like incredible people who like taught me so much and I and it was so, it's so refreshing to like meet all these people with all these different backgrounds who are passionate about the same thing you are 
and who want to tell people and inform the public and I just I, it that's one of my favorite parts about this yeah mine too uh B what uh, has been your favorite part of this project so far well basically exactly what Parker said being able to meet the cast and being able to connect with everyone is just amazing because everyone is so great and we're all so similar but different at the same time it's it's really been amazing yeah i totally agree oscar um what's been your favorite part of this project overall i feel i agree with you guys definitely i mean it's been such a incredibly fun <laughs> and <laughs> educational experience so far and i I appreciate all of you guys, and I appreciate um, all the work that's being put into this project so that we can um, continue, and just all of that feels very special, like a very unique opportunity that we're having, and I'm grateful for that. Well, thank you guys for those very wholesome and sweet answers. <laughs> um, our last question is... Um, when we were rehearsing for our the original show, we got into what I would like to identify as quote unquote shenanigans this year. Um, what's the funniest thing that happened during our time together? I think it is very hard to pick just one. It's really hard just to pick one off the top of my head, <laughs> but um, in like the top 10, probably it would be when I was trying to figure out the delivery for my monologue and I was, <laughs> I, I was with, I think it was Oscar and Caden, and they were just clowning on on my monologue. This, <laughs> this, uh, it was it was really it was really amazing because I was super struggling, and then I have these people out here laughing at my work. It was can you, it was really can you great. Explain what uh, clowning entails. <laughs> they were okay. So I was trying to figure out the deli the delivery, and I was reading the intro. I was. So the line was, so yeah. there's this girl. And <laughs> they were, <laughs> I can't even. So Oscar and Caden were, were repeating that line <laughs> in the most ridiculous ways possible. And it was only getting funnier and funnier. And it was just, it was just great. So every time I read my monologue and I have to read, so there's this girl. <laughs> I can't do it seriously, and it's, I'm just, I'm so grateful for them that now I have, like, these wonderful Aww. memories attached to Aww. that. Oscar, can you give us an example of a, so there's this girl? <laughs> <laughs> so, I think, I don't know, that was such a random thing that we did. I think it was because it was such a serious, like, um, we talked about it very seriously at first, like, giving the advice and stuff, and then it was just like, <laughs> So there's this girl. <laughs> like, that's the end of the monologue. And for some reason, that was the, the funniest thing. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There are some kinds of identity that we are born with, while others are developed over time. Some folks are still exploring what parts of their identity feel right to them. Others have found their truth. In one way or another, identity has shaped the stories of each of these three teens, and now they want to share those stories with the world. And that's what Teen Monologues is, is for, a chance to be heard, a chance to share their story. Thank you, Parker, Oscar, and B, for being here with us today and giving others an opportunity to listen. And that's it for today. Come back next week when our focus will be on family. Thanks for listening, and remember, our stories are what unite us. The people who help produce and record our show include John Hollander, Sophia Longas, Emma Fay, and Daniel Mitchell. Our cover art was created by Sophie Smith. For more info on Teen Monologues and other projects, visit our website at teen.capslo.org or check out our Instagram at C-A-P-S-L-O Teen Programs. This project was made possible by a grant from the Office of Population Affairs. The contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of HHS. <laughs>